Hi everybody. Um, so tonight I just wanted to talk a little bit about um, studying Asia and specifically Pakistan here. Um, so if you're not familiar um, with Pakistan um, and India and Bangladesh, um, basically um, it's right next to the Middle East um, and basically on the edge here is Pakistan um, as you head into the rest of Asia. So um, the interesting thing is that um, if you're European uh, or African, um, basically uh, Pakistan is kind of the first um, kind of green area as you get into Asia um, here. And then also um, you can see on this side here is Turkey. Um, so you basically have the Middle East, um, Iraq here, um, <coughs> Saudi Arabia, Iran, um, and then this river area here, uh, the Indus River, um, which is Pakistan. Um, and then up north, you basically have Russia, um, but kind of divided by uh, some pretty heavy mountain ranges. Um, this is the largest mountain range on Earth. Um, and there's basically two sides to this mountain range. Uh, one side is on Pakistan's side. The other side is kind of India and Bangladesh, uh, this corner up in here um, that heads out into Cambodia and Vietnam. Um, so just as a disclaimer, um, I do have a small investment in the stock market um, with Global X, uh, but it's just a small investment, so there is a little bit of bias um, in Pakistan for me, um, but um, that's just at the time of recording this, um, so I may or may not have that. Um, but uh, one thing to think about um, is how um, the world works. Um, so basically, um, if you're interested in um, basically Asia, um, one of the interesting things is that uh, one of the bigger topics um, is population. Um, uh, and when you combine basically India with Pakistan and Bangladesh, uh, which is basically kind of similar culture in some ways, um, but actually very different too in other ways, um, you basically have a fairly large population of people here, um, almost even more than China. So um, it becomes an important topic. Um, and when you kind of start to divide up the topic of India um, and the Middle East, um, and you want to uh, look at even uh, questions of how that relates to Europe and the rest of the world. Um, in terms of import and export, um, for example, Pakistan and Bangladesh have uh, one to two percent of all the clothing is made there. So, basically, a very significant amount of clothing um, is made in uh, Pakistan and Bangladesh. Um, so before we get into some negative points or positive points, I'll just look at this uh, kind of the investment perspective. Um, so uh, this is a, a company that specializes in ETFs. Um, they have had an ETF in Pakistan since uh, 2015. And you can see it's actually been struggling quite a bit. It started around $60 and now it's down to about 15. So one of the theories um, in investment is using the MACD. Um, and you can see here there's a crossing right here um, on the MACD. There's also another crossing right here on the MACD. Um, basically, there's a MACD line and a signal line. And what most people say, typically in investment um, philosophy, um, using this MACD, um, is that when these signals cross, um, basically this is a bad sign, and you basically go down until the signal crosses again. You can see right here there was a crossing, and the stock went up again, and the stock basically was kind of going up and down there's a bad part in here um, and down and then it crossed the signal crossed again here and went down so you can see we're maybe at another point where there might be another crossing on a positive note so that could be a sign um, for um, maybe a good time to invest um, in Pakistan so you can see here that that's not always the case because you have a cleaner volume oscillator um, and that looks like it could be actually on the opposite crossing where the red line is up above um, so that could be a problem as well. Another way to look at um, Pakistan investment um, is to see that you can see that this was uh, during the financial crisis, uh, COVID uh, and whatnot. Um, so you can see there was a lot of negative investment that started here. This is called the Elder Force Index. And this basically takes the volume of the uh, security and takes the price in consideration too. So you can see there was quite a lot of negativity here. Um, and quite some positivity. So we're still kind of maybe a few months out into uh, some positivity, um, at least on the uh, force index. Um, but you never know, it could be a good time even now. Um, some people would say wait until this summer 
um, and then things might be getting better is one approach. So um, this is also the money flow. So you can see basically when you're below this line, the money has been flowing out of the market. Um, and this is a basically a simple calculation of just uh, another price and volume uh, kind of uh, estimator. So you can see that uh, money is kind of flowing back into the stock, but um, changing a little bit. So before I get into uh, some more financial details, let's just look at this uh, atlas of economic complexity. It is very helpful uh, for seeing what's going on in a country. Now, this will basically show you what the problem is in Pakistan, is that basically they have a very centralized economy, basically making almost 50% of that in textiles. Um, and then the other percentage of the economy is really dependent on food. Um, and you can see on the import side, um, it's a little bit different. They have a little more diversity, um, but basically on the export sides, they're very big. And then even on technology, so this is um, basically internet uh, technology kind of stuff, ICT. Uh, you see transportation is pretty big, and actually tourism is pretty big there too. Um, it's interesting to see the map. Um, this shows you how important um, Afghanistan is in what's going on in Pakistan as well as China. So they're basically exporting most of their stuff to the United States um, and well basically most of the stuff is sent to the United States. So um, four billion dollars or so um, and that's a pretty big percentage and then they also send a, quite a lot to Germany here uh, and the United Kingdom um, and in fact they're sending uh, more almost the same that they send to Ch all of China is sent into Europe. So they actually send more to Europe than they do to China. So, um, but you can see some little details here. Um, right here, UAE is exported too. So the reason you want to look at this map is how to kind of improve the economy in Pakistan, right? Um, and that's a complicated kind of thing. Um, obviously, distance matters because that costs a lot to ship a product. Um, let's look really quick at the import. So this is where your problems are. So basically, um, they're importing maybe too much from China um, and even the United States, they're importing a lot. So um, it may be wise to, it's not so bad to import something from a local neighbor, um, but uh, importing uh, maybe more from uh, the Middle East would be wise and also India, um, if you just look at the maps a little bit. Um, so. Um, and also, uh, you know, it, it is important to realize that the economies in the Middle East are kind of struggling right now, um, and that's one major factor. So let's look at the currency really quick relative to the Indian rupee. So down here is the Indian rupee, um, and you can see the Indian rupee um, basically has had um, some struggles too, but it hasn't been as bad. So really in 2017, that's when things got expensive extremely bad. So you can start to see that they're basically they really started to rocket up here uh, in the uh, value of the rupees. So let me delete uh, this really quick and you can see the price. So basically the current value of the rupee is about 200 to $1. So that was originally um, back in 2000 about 50 to one. So basically we've gone from 51 to 200 or even 250 to one. So we're actually kind of, we even spiked up in here um, at a point um, which looked pretty bad. So there was kind of um, a stabilization, but then right after this, uh, another major problem right here in about uh, July um, of 2021. So if you wanna look at that, that would be interesting uh, to see the exact dates. Um, in terms of economic policy and things like that. So yeah, this is really good and important. <clears throat> so you can see um, essentially precisely where the problems are in terms of economic problems. So you can see <clears throat> January uh, 2008. <clears throat> and then roughly speaking, uh, <clears throat> September of 2011. Um, and then you can see another major thing here around November of 2017. Um, and even this point here, which actually May of 2021. So um, things were actually getting better um, and then uh, something right around there. So those are all points in history. Um, it's nice to have actual data to kind of back up where you see the problem is in terms of finance. So I don't really know why I'm showing this, but basically <clears throat> population map, you can kind of see some of the <clears throat> question here. So you have to combine this um, with the Google Earth map 
Um, and once you see, <clears throat> you basically see that the law population is out towards here, uh, Lahore and actually Islamabad. So that's kind of a weird problem because actually the air pollution is quite bad up in this area by New Delhi. It gets trapped on the mountain range. Um, so that's something to think about um, in terms of working with Pakistan is that basically there is a lot of pollution up in this area. Karachi basically gets the, the fresh air, the waterfront here. Um, and then a lot of people basically live along the river here. Um, so you can see the river, Sindhu River, uh, basically veins kind of heading down through here uh, with a lot of uh, maybe even flooding problems um, in certain areas um, of the uh, river. So basically this all heads up into Khyber right here, which is Khyber Pass and then Afghanistan. Um, so it's very interesting um, thinking about uh, relationships between countries. So let's take a quick look again at this map. So you can see basically this is the river that we were looking at um, and basically Pakistan being in here. So why is it so important? Um, basically this is one of the most populated places on earth um, right here um, and basically over here in China. Uh, and basically India is expected to be the most populated. So basically in terms of population um, and lots of people, this is what is happening on earth. So. Um, you basically see also that this is a major transitioning point between the Middle East. So you basically have Iran, Afghanistan. So if you're trying to work with the Middle East, this is the primary point um, that basically you think in terms of the Middle East heading into Asia. So all of these people in the Middle East <clears throat> basically work through Pakistan um, in order to uh, work with even China, India, the rest of Southeast Asia. You basically sail around here. Um, we're gonna look at some other maps in a moment, um, I'm seeing marine traffic maps, uh, as well as the internet, how the internet works. Um, <clears throat> you basically see <clears throat> a lot of that going through Mumbai <clears throat> and Karachi. So one of the biggest questions in Asia is actually uh, Russia, right? So basically a lot of uh, the green areas are up in here. It gets very cold in the winter time, um, but there is um, maybe more clouds uh, and rain. Um, it basically, a lot of the clouds are generated in the Arctic. Um, some of them actually come up uh, from the uh, coastline, but they get basically trapped along the uh, mountain range here. They can't, the clouds can't get over here, so this becomes all desert. <laughs> Again, these are the highest mountains in the world. Um, you can kind of start to see uh, that if you zoom in here a little bit. Um, it's actually very beautiful up in here, and I think that's one of the reasons why people live up here. Uh, but um, basically, this is very highly populated. So I'm gonna look at this whole population, and you can kind of see here um, that most of that population that we've been discussing, uh, sorry about this, uh, but basically this is kind of the population here. This is a little bit older of a map, um, but um, basically, <clears throat> you kind of see there's these areas here, and even in Northern Europe, there's quite a lot of population kind of around here in Amsterdam, if you're not aware of that. You can see Nigeria here, <clears throat> kind of Sao Paulo down here in New York City, Los Angeles, and kind of the West Coast, um, and even Florida, and kind of some parts of uh, <clears throat> here. So, um, but basically, India being extremely populated, um, and basically, you can kind of see <clears throat> how Pakistan fits into that. And some of this kind of tells you the story of transportation. You can see uh, here in northern Iran, um, but basically how um, some of the religions and ideas and trade routes have worked over the thousands and thousands of years. But basically you can see northern Iran, um, so a lot of maybe uh, transportation from here, and then kind of the population showing <clears throat> approximately how you might sail over into Karachi area and India and then might get even stuck here in India, um, <clears throat> and even coming up from Africa, uh, and so on. But it's really important to look at the uh, transportation nowadays um, actually coming from India and Asia into Africa, right? Uh, and also up into the Middle East. So basically a lot of the more desirable land, um, which you'll see is actually not necessarily in the Middle East. So as you look at this map, um, you think about uh, where people are trying to go, Still, Pakistan is right on that edge um, of everything here, right? So basically, um, you have uh, some opportunities, to, but you have to maybe sail down through here. Um, and um, again, we'll look, let's look at the shipping routes for right away here. So sorry for this extremely cluttered map, but there is just a tremendous amount <coughs> of shipping. So you basically see what's going on right now. So basically, uh, green ships are cargo. Uh, red here is... Uh, 
is actually uh, oil tankers. So you can see that actually most of the shipping right now um, from Asia bypasses um, actually India and actually heads out um, around. They don't even go through this area, which is kind of weird. I think the currents are quite strong and dangerous um, through Jakarta, but basically they head around Singapore up through this way. Um, and then a lot of them uh, just go down here to Cape Town. Um, and around so um, but yet this is a very shipping busy shipping port here um, and actually for oil um, a lot of that will come out of essentially Iraq um, and uh, this part of uh, the ocean here um, and then uh, head out through here so sorry it's a little bit hard to see on this map but let's zoom in and see exactly what's going on so you kind of start to see um, that a lot of that shipping uh, comes around the tip here um, and uh, moves. So, so I just want to emphasize um, that if you looked at that uh, map of economic complexity here and you look at the tree map, um, you basically start to see that uh, internet, um, and that actually doesn't really show it in two digit codes, but you see basically the internet and technology is starting to become a pretty big thing uh, that is actually on imports, but you can see on exports, um, this is a 15% of their economy. So the internet is no joke um, in terms of jobs and everything around the world. You'll see that this oftentimes hits 20% or even more in some countries of their economy. So um, the technological economy is super important um, to realize how important that is. So we're gonna take a careful look here at the submarine cable fiber optic map. Um, and basically see how the internet works uh, in Pakistan and the rest of the world. So if I click here, you can kind of see this is the global map perspective. Um, so there is a lot of internet here, um, but if you specifically pick on Pakistan um, and Karachi, you can see how their internet works. You can basically divide it up into maybe two or three segments. So it's basically the part that heads around Africa, um, and that's basically run by this main line here. There's these Africa 2 and Africa 1 lines. Um, <coughs> And then you basically have Karachi here. Now, actually, even Karachi may be more busy than, uh, in terms of internet, uh, than Mumbai. Now, I'm not sure on that. We can kind of look here. You can compare Mumbai, maybe slightly more uh, in Mumbai. But actually, the internet in Karachi is probably as good or better um, in Karachi than in Mumbai. And Mumbai is the main port, really, for internet in all of India. Um, so India... Uh, it's something that's something to think about now uh, what I kind of did here is I looked at um, <coughs> that as well as some uh, air traffic lines um, but uh, what I saw that was particularly interesting um, is this uh, trans world uh, connection here um, this one I can click on and kind of show you so this is a smaller internet route um, just heading over to here to UAE and also uh, I think this might be Djibouti or Oman sorry about that um, but uh, when you start to look at smaller routes like that, you can start to see how to uh, basically collaborate on uh, the internet uh, in Pakistan. Um, a lot of that was done through Tata, Tata which actually is an Indian company, um, but uh, there are some other companies here. Um, you can see this line here we can look at. This is primarily um, a Middle Eastern line, but actually heads right along the shipping routes um, that we saw before, but they're all kind of going into this uh, location here. Um, and uh, basically that's one interesting thing to think about. So, uh, but when you look at the greater internet, uh, certainly uh, this line is a very important line uh, for uh, Pakistan and India, uh, basically heading into Southeast Asia and even hitting Australia down there in Perth. So this is maybe a bad time to do this, but you can basically start to see the flight patterns in uh, Pakistan and India and basically the rest of the world. Um, so you basically see that there is a lot of flights going through Dubai here um, in general. Um, so as you head uh, basically into Europe, um, and uh, you can see Europe basically being flooded and the United States is being flooded with routes right now. But this is a nighttime. Um, you know, we're daytime here, they're nighttime there. Um, so it is not the best time to look at this graph. Um, but you can start to see where the busy ports are. Um, and basically Karachi, uh, Islamabad, and Lahore are kind of the big, this is Karachi here, uh, and then up here is Islamabad, and then you have uh, Lahore, and then you can see Delhi here, and Mumbai. Um, so uh, I would 
say studying this very carefully can really tell you a lot. Um, and the way that you do that uh, essentially is by looking at the arrivals and departures. Um, so uh, remember we were looking at the shipping map here, but now we're kind of looking at air traffic. So what you do is you can click on one of these guys, uh, you can click on more, uh, and then it will show you basically where the routes are off out of Karachi, right? So uh, you can see Islamabad being the number one uh, and then Lahore being number two. Um, and then uh, the important starting thing to think about is how important Dubai is. Um, so that is kind of an interesting question in general because uh, what we see uh, here is that Dubai becomes not only a major port for Pakistan, but also a port for India. A lot of people basically heading over to Dubai. Um, and that really is an interesting problem because the oil in the Middle East is expected to only be kind of really important for the next 10 to 20 years, and even 20 years might be stretching it. Um, so that kind of business is really kind of important to think about. The temperatures get very hot in Dubai. Um, in the winter time, they could be pretty nice. Um, like now, it could be good, but it is important to think about all aspects. Um, so where do you look outside of that? Um, now, I've kind of looked at the flight schedules um, here, and basically what happens, in, at least in India, is a lot of people start to head into East Africa uh, and even Nigeria. So basically, there are some, you can get a $400 one-way flight out of uh Mumbai, for instance, over to uh, Nigeria. There's also a Mombasa port here um, and Cape Town, or even you'll be very surprised how busy Johannesburg is. So as an alternative, um, a lot of people have kind of switched to East Africa. Um, and that is very interesting because there is some really nice land down in here. Um, I'm still a little bit skeptical of why Johannesburg, but this is more mining. So it's really interesting that the basically have natural resources um, becoming very important. Um, a lot of people say that there's a trillion dollar or more, I don't know what the number is in Afghanistan, but um, natural resources. So the, that, uh, you know, that there is a lot of mining uh, to be done here. So I'm a little bit skeptical about some of that. I think that the technology sector is still something to really think about. So this is technology sector. You can see that copper is a fairly big uh, part of the economy, um, but technology and transportation still be more so that I think we're always going to see uh, transportation become very important even as we try to leave earth um, and basically as you start to talk about these halfway points um, I'm sorry about this Hold on, let's get this here so as you look at transportation around the earth um, basically these are kind of the point this is the point at which you kind of like maybe even stop on your journey uh, heading into uh, basically the Far East, right? And islands, it's the first point um, where you really start to get to get familiar with the culture um, of what's the trend, cultural transition point uh, between kind of the Middle East uh, and the rest of Asia. So one super interesting thing is that after Dubai, uh, the next busiest port is Jeddah. So uh, that's basically in Saudi Arabia here. So. Um, interesting thing to think about is that basically what that tells you is that this area is primarily Muslim um, and basically that's one key to tell you about things. So basically this line is kind of the line between Hinduism and Islam um, and you actually have a weird uh, point where Bangladesh uh, and actually Indonesia has the highest number of Muslims uh, on earth. Uh, so it's very strange how this works uh, in terms of religion, uh, but basically um, that's an important point. And that kind of suggests that because you have this link here and this link here, that this is primarily going to be an East African uh, uh, kind of uh, work. So as you kind of divide up uh, the work uh, for India to do in the future and Pakistan, you might even argue that, well, India at this point, <clears throat> this point, you basically have um, uh, always being kind of a <clears throat> transitional point um, for the Middle East, but basically this is kind of heading towards Africa, um, whereas India is kind of heading 
points down south um, and heads basically over into Asia. So this point in here, which is basically <clears throat> New Delhi and Lahore, and you'll notice that Lahore primarily the city's kind of sprawling out towards New Delhi, so it's kind of pointing this way. So even if you live in Lahore, you're basically going to be heading out more towards uh, Southeast Asia and that region. So this is basically African um, in, in a lot of senses in terms of what the future might bring. You can just see just from the river, it's all kind of heading that way, and there's kind of a little curve here. But heading out that way, uh, in general, you can see kind of the fault lines in the ocean, even heading out here uh, and then kind of over here to Zanzibar. I'm kind of familiar with these two little islands here. I've been looking at that, uh, but Mombasa over here and Kenya and so on. So, and even this kind of Madagascar being more of an interesting place um, actually for Pakistan, right? Um, so um, <clears throat> Sri Lanka being kind of uh, very much tied to India, uh, but kind of heading out towards here. So the interesting point on that flight schedule is there's actually another, we noticed both the internet kind of heading in here, but you can see another port, um, Sharjah, uh, being pretty busy uh, for Pakistan as well. So <clears throat> these are all really interesting points um, and should each be studied in great detail, uh, definitely. So I won't go too much into all these, but here's, you can see Jeddah and then Sharjah and then actually Prussia War being pretty busy and that's actually heading out into Afghanistan. Uh, you can see Doha, Qatar, uh, and uh, I think Bahrain here. And actually the very important point here is Istanbul. And you'll see Istanbul show up uh, on the flight plus for uh, actually uh, Lahore as well. Um, and even, I think especially in Islamabad. So if we were to click here on Islamabad, um, click more, I think we're also gonna see Istanbul actually being even busier um, in uh, Islamabad. So. You see Karachi being the number one port, um, and then actually Dubai being the second. Um, so you don't even see any place in India um, at all, right? So basically, that's a very interesting point, right? So it kind of says one thing that, uh, I mean, if this doesn't change, then you basically have political differences between India and Pakistan, right? So basically Dubai, um, kind of answering the question, uh, Jeddah answering the question here, Abu Dhabi, Doha, um, Riyadh here, uh, and then Istanbul. So I think <laughs> Muscat here, Qatar, and there. So you basically have to argue that. Um, so let me just zoom out here. So we're basically talking about this entire country being right next to India. And India, when they do flights, they often do flights across country for under $100, usually around $50. You can go from say Mumbai to uh, Bangalore or something. So pretty cheap flight for that. Um, but, uh, and then maybe $150 to get outside of India or $250 to get over to Europe or something. So, but basically you're basically talking about this being very important, the point that it's heading into Africa. You do not see that in India. Um, you see a much more diverse uh, flight pattern um, and not so heavily linked with the Middle East. Now, it is just very important to realize that how important the food policy is, um, both in Turkey, Iran, um, and actually Pakistan to feeding uh, the Middle East here, just from the logistical standpoint. You may have quite a lot of ships coming in here um, into Iraq, uh, as we saw, uh, and then some heading around here. Um, but uh, basically, it is very important. Uh, Turkey is extremely important to the Middle East. So, um, and at that point, once you start talking about this, you actually get into uh, parts of Iran here um, and Azerbaijan and this mountain range becoming kind of the dividing point uh, between Russia and the Middle East. And you actually see that there's a city, there's cities in here um, that are basically Russian, Ukrainian, um, and that becoming kind of the other aspect of what's going on here. Um, and these are very beautiful mountains, They're actually taller than uh, mountains here are actually right in here. So it actually becomes, I mean, the Himalayas are even much larger. So basically, um, you know, you basically have kind of this, how this transition works. So I'm gonna just get a quick look at this. This is land use, but you can kind of see, um, it is maybe even more helpful to look at the 
through Earth map, but it's nice to just see some different kind of maps here. But you can kind of see this flood zone here, just south of Karachi. It's a little bit more visible on a geological map, and we'll go into those in a second here. Um, but you can sign to see forests, small trees, um, and basically uh, how important wheat is and even cotton uh, is uh, early on um, because of the uh, clothing industry. I'm just going to go through a bunch of quick maps. Um, now, this is only one perspective of how the eighth ethnic groups work uh, in Pakistan. I would say this is totally wrong in general, but you basically could divide it up into two halves or four parts. Um, there's going to be different ethnic groups that we're going to look at. Um, but basically, you have this part in the south. You basically have this part here, uh, kind of even showing uh, into New Delhi here, which is interesting. Um, and then kind of uh, Prussia war here, and then basically into Afghanistan. Super interesting map also is to think about the uh, other religions in Pakistan, although it is mostly um, Muslim and Islam. But you can see there's some Christian parts here, um, and there's different Hindu parts actually over in this part, this region, uh, Pakistan. You see this chart here, they're basically mostly Sunni um, and maybe a part Shia, and then you can see uh, other percentages, but uh, that's an interesting chart to look at as well. So basically find the best ethnic group map on this page, um, and this is a little bit more detailed, and you can start to see um, kind of how the mountain range affects things. So basically, essentially, the mountain range starts here, um, and there's kind of a weird part of Pakistan that actually maybe even should be a part of Afghanistan and maybe shared more, but there's a little weird mountain range here and it kind of comes along here, right? And then there's um, heading up into here. So you kind of see the Punjabi parts uh, and uh, different parts here. So it is an interesting map to look at. So we're gonna primarily look at how to improve uh, life in Pakistan and uh, throughout Asia and the Middle East. Um, one of the ways obviously is with transportation and the port of Karachi. So it would be really wise to take a careful look at the port of Karachi. You can see uh, some pictures here. Um, and we did look uh, at how busy that was and you can kind of see um, this is being quite red here area um, and busy port. Up in the corner here, you can even see a little link and you can get um, a picture of where that port is. Um, so you can kind of see this is down in Karachi here. Um, but basically, um, all these maps are really helpful. Um, you can get some detailed views. You can basically see the port is right there. So uh, what I would do is grab the satellite map here, and you can open up that. That will load uh, and give you kind of a picture for what this is like. Um, for some reason, I can't get a 3D image of this, but we can try to look at that. So you kind of see uh, that the terminal is off on this side here, and it's quite large. Uh, and actually, it looks like it even takes up both sides. Um, of this so I don't really see this um, in some places um, but it kind of vaguely reminds me of uh, Port of Los Angeles for some reason um, so um, but uh, you can kind of see there's kind of this uh, sandbar here as you head out um, and uh, this being a major part of Karachi so in terms of work job market um, you probably have to live maybe on this side so it looks a little bit complicated Getting to the port, it looks like they have a bridge um, that heads over there. So here's kind of an interesting perspective, um, but you can basically see that the weird thing about Karachi in particular is that the floodplain basically is all this river zone, right? Uh, if it's green, it's basically from the floodplain. Um, so uh, the river is actually could be anywhere. Um, so, uh, But Karachi basically is a little bit of a safe haven because it's kind of up here on the hills here. So it actually is kind of dry um, a little bit there. So I don't know if you can see what's going on, but basically this is all Karachi here, um, and we're completely avoiding the topic of Islamabad and Lahore at this point, um, and kind of focusing here on Karachi. Um, so uh, basically, uh, that's an important point. So, um, but basically you can see uh, what's going on here. You kind of have a weird uh, floodplain right in here, right? Uh, and then Karachi kind of being up in here. Um, there are a number of rivers kind of heading through Karachi, um, but you can see these are the ports. Uh, it's kind of loading in here. It's taking a little bit to load, sorry about that. Um, but uh, you can see some of the, all these uh, buildings, it's kind of still adding buildings uh, to this Karachi, Karachi skyline. But this basically shows how important the port is. You got port all the way back into here. Looks like even some land reclamation uh, area. Um, trying to rebuild. Uh, this is happening all over the world now. 
uh, in places like Nigeria, uh, Manila, they're just doing this land reclamation project. So I don't know about that. That's a little bit weird. Um, but, you know, with the flooding that we've seen, I mean, we saw these 20 foot waves um, over in Japan. I don't know how you can prepare for um, 20, 50 foot waves off of tsunamis and things like that. But it's a land reclamation project. So you can see a lot of little boats out here, which looks kind of interesting. And then kind of a whole housing development here. Um, and, you know, it just seems to me like a whole lot of work. It seems like what they're doing is just adding land uh, and then kind of moving people. Obviously, they have a lot of workforce here on this island um, working at the uh, port um, as well as being able to work on uh, construction here. It's actually a steel mill off into the side here. Um, that's interesting to think about. But the weird thing is we're kind of totally focused on the port here, and it's just so important to see how important that port is. Um, and basically this all being part of Karachi, but basically the main downtown area, you can see these Wikipedia markings. It calls this the center of Karachi. Um, and you can see uh, some of these other areas. So the problem that you kind of get in some of these cities is that the port becomes so important uh, you see this in Manila as well, is that they're basically so in need of imports and exports, especially on the import side, um, that the port basically takes up all the nice skyline. So one thing I would question is just uh, how this works in the future um, and making it, because there is a lot of noise generated. It's not always that desirable to live right next to a port, um, but at least there are jobs and things like that. So. Um, but what I would do is if you are using this for Karachi, uh, definitely take a look at the Wikipedia links. Uh, these are really interesting to see. Um, and you can kind of zoom in and out um, and see essentially what's going on uh, in Karachi. Um, so there is quite a lot of uh, suburbia here as well. Um, you can add transportation. It doesn't really do that too well. Uh, if you add the roads, that can be helpful. Um, and there is, I think, just regular trains. So this starts to show where the train system is. You kind of see the train actually being primarily over here um, and then heading out into here and so on. So that being a very important link and it can be quite busy on the trains. I've seen some packed trains in Asia. So I'm not an expert on train system, but uh, looks like <clears throat> it's not exactly what they're doing good right now. So the weird thing is that <clears throat> I think it's just so dry on this side and then they're just used to this floodplain. So it's kind of battling with the development of Karachi on the floodplain here. And it just makes you wonder if so many people are flying out to Dubai, Jeddah, Saudi Arabia, why not just develop this part and you get a lot better beachfront. And even over here, you got Paradise Point and so on. So um, and even changing the port entirely, um, I mean, it does cost quite a lot uh, to create a new rail system, but like places like Rio de Janeiro, they have kind of a long beach line, uh, but it is so nice to be right on the waterfront. Um, and, you know, it is dry here and you kind of keep the mangroves safe so you don't have to develop into this area anyway because you're talking about a floodplain. Um, and you're not going to have the floodplain problems here um, as you head out here. And you can see there's a power grid point here. Um, so you're right closer to the power grid, which is another question. Um, but anyway, something to think about um, in terms of what's going on. But you can kind of see the road system here heading along the river here and then heading out uh, into the rest of Pakistan. So this is a really hard map to even begin to understand, but you basically start to see the power grid for Pakistan. Um, and, you know, as you zoom in here, you start to see what's going on. There's basically the power grid follows the river. Um, and it's not too detailed here relative to India. So I don't know if that's just because of the maps, but you start to see some of the power uh, generators here, um, even hydro power and uh, some other things. Um, but uh, basically, it's super important to look at this power grid um, and think about what's going on. Um, certainly, that's been a big a uh, Chinese investment came in, I don't know, in the billions of dollars. I don't know what the exact number was, but they basically invested in, I don't know, it was like 10 power stations in Pakistan or more. So it may be that all these are kind of owned by China and in fact run 
partially by Pakistan. And a lot of debate was that uh, in terms of when they built these power grids, um, should China really be running them with their people or should they be running them primarily with Pakistani people? Um, and you, of course, need some expert outside expertise. It's very wise to have a balance. Um, but, uh, you know, the electrical grid is a big factor um, for uh, things. And even into Afghanistan and Iran, um, when you think about Iran, it's perhaps one of the more important questions is how to get power to Iran. So anyway, huge topic, um, but you do have at least two or three power stations here um, in Karachi, and you can see essentially how that works. Um, you can even add, uh, I think, telecom towers here, which is pretty interesting, oil and gas, water lines, and some others, but it doesn't always show up in every country. Uh, but you can start to see a little bit more details. Um, there's even some other substations that didn't show up originally here, um, but um, certainly um, this is very interesting to see. Um, and you can kind of see that they're already gearing up for some power uh, heading out into more of the west side of Karachi. Um, now, <clears throat> this is completely, again, not looking at uh, Lahore and Islamabad. Um, and of the two, I'd say definitely Islamabad would be more interesting to look at. Um, it's just further from India and more up into the mountains, uh, which gets pretty beautiful area. Um, so uh, one of the questions in Pakistan is just how to get people moving out of the middle of Pakistan and more towards Karachi and Islamabad. So, And Islamabad is tricky because you get the pollution problem not only from Pakistan but India. So you basically have to start to argue that um, at least on a uh, sorry about this. So when you start to zoom out and look at all of what's going on, um, we're just looking at Karachi, you basically have these areas which basically need to be primarily farmland. So you basically have to agree in Pakistan to not, uh, you know, they, they basically have to have a policy where you can have cars in some areas but not others. And it, this whole area needs to have no cars. And then you basically need to have a very good train system and start moving people out of these areas and maybe over to the end of the waterways. And actually that helps the wildlife too because these areas historically have been a lot of wildlife and what's been happening is that the wildlife moves further and further up because you get basically dirty water at the end of the river here. Um, and there even needs to be some work done um, to kind of barricade this. You don't see it on this map. But on a live satellite map, you will see, and I should probably look at a live satellite map, you will see the extent to which the pollution comes out of these areas uh, could be 50 miles, 100 miles out into the ocean um, as they empty here. And this shows all blue, but it is not uh, blue water coming out of there. So, uh, but basically, how do you deal with this is that you basically have to have a policy in Islamabad for no cars um, and focus on public transportation here and even definitely no cars back in through here. So it's just hard because there's millions and millions of people living in these areas and they basically need to move to the coastline um, or other areas. Uh, so obviously this could be populated with people. It does get hot um, here, um, but the water temperature helps cool off uh, the shorefront. So um, how they do this in the future, I don't know, but you know, we're talking about a billion plus people uh, in India uh, and in Pakistan. So it just becomes a very complicated um, idea of how to help people move to other areas. So right now, um, you know, basically Afghanistan is really struggling. Um, a lot of people come in through here um, and then basically come down in through these areas. So it becomes a very important uh, refugee area um, and just so many other factors. So I've loaded up a few of these websites. We looked at the um, infrastructure grid. So we're looking primarily at the internet here. Um, but uh, if you look at some of these companies, these are Transworld Associates Private Limited. Uh, you have this other company. You can kind of see their internet route here. Um, and then another inner route called the CME We 3 um, and this looks like a very interesting route um, and actually heading all the way over here you can see points in Korea and Osaka and even Australia so that actually becomes very interesting and why they didn't do this route uh, further down Africa that's basically because the Africa 1 route and Africa 2 route is going to be coming in in 2024 and 2025 so 
uh, if you looked at this map here and we clicked on the full route uh, and then we click on Pakistan with Karachi, you can see that these Africa 2 route and Africa 1 route haven't even been built yet. Um, and there's this this route here that's being built in 2025. So there is quite a lot of plans. This was updated December 15th of 2022. So quite recently, uh, we are seeing some information on this. So these are all very great companies um, for Pakistan to definitely focus on and work on, you know, uh, working on uh, not only the power grid as we've been looking at here, um, and you can see basically how that power grid works. Uh, but definitely also the internet. So, uh, and that's because basically this 15% here uh, could improve a little bit and they can probably get a little bit more, maybe even robotics involved in the textile industries. It's great to have a big, a lot of production, um, but maybe more of that might even change into uh, the copper range. And actually um, you can see on the copper market uh, that iron, steel they definitely could uh, use that for building materials uh, and other things so so we have looked at the cultural map and you can kind of see that the soil map actually is very helpful to see um, so you can kind of think of culture as soil in some senses and you kind of see that this all this river area once you get out of the flood zone you basically have um, this whole zone here um, and that kind of meaning that the culture um, you get the, kind of the Punjabi culture as you head up into the hills here, but um, actually could be pretty similar because it's along the river, Ganges, Yamuna, and the Sindhu River here. So uh, this is actually a geological map, um, and you can see um, that, you know, it's kind of weird because actually most of the valuable rock actually is up in here in outside of Kabul and Afghanistan. Um, and you can see uh, this kind of being... Uh, pretty similar um, on the foothills here and down in the valley. So ingenious rock is basically the pink rock, which is what you're kind of looking for uh, in general, but uh, there is uh, kind of some other kinds of rock in here as well um, that could be interesting to look at. So the good news here is that basically, you know, as they partner up, as Islamabad works more on the mining, with Cabal, that would be very important to have a solid relationship because basically, the, you know, Cabal will probably be um, a better city than Islamabad to some extent, uh, at least in terms of wealth um, and business because of the mining industry. Um, I don't know what kind of industry you're going to do in Islamabad um, up here in the mountains, um, but basically that's kind of the capital region. Um, and then you basically have down here in Karachi. I really like looking at traffic congestion maps. Um, they can be quite interesting for the cities. Um, you can see here is Karachi, uh, kind of along, along the port area. Um, actually, that's heading into the port here um, and heading out of the port, that region. And you can kind of see um, where the traffic congestion is. Um, so, you know, I mean, this is a major port. It's um, millions or even billions of dollars just to construct the port here. Um, moving that anytime soon may be a challenge, but it looks like they're doing a land reclamation project here. I don't know that for sure, but um, it would be interesting to rethink about the port of Karachi a little bit. Um, I may go into some of the field maps uh, for the earth a little bit. I'm not gonna do that right now, but you should definitely take a look at this. Kind of gives you some interesting ideas about how the uh, basically environment, uh, the airflow systems, and uh, electromagnetic fields work uh, all over the world. Um, but you can kind of see some of that. We'll just load this map up really quick if I can. Um, but you can kind of see, um, you know, basically what's happening here along this green line. This is kind of uh, zero declination, uh, meaning the field is basically correct. But you can see, uh, for the most part, you're not too far away from that zero line over here in Pakistan. This is more a topographical map, um, not necessarily geological, but you can see these hills, so you can kind of see what happened in Karachi. This kind of gives you a very good image uh, about this. You can see this is the uh, line here. Uh, they maybe even should have drawn, <laughs> drawn it. You know, they, they drew the line here for very biased towards Pakistan, not biased <laughs> towards Afghanistan at all. And it may be, um, 
very interesting uh, problems because this line probably should be drawn around in here and these lakes. I mean, it's just hard uh, for Afghanistan in general. They don't have any port access whatsoever um, and, even, and even working directly with Afghanistan on getting some oceanfront uh, port like this over here. You can see that city um, kind of helping Afghanistan uh, work um, and uh, enjoy their lives outside of just Kabul. So, uh, you know, Pakistan needs to have a very close relationship um, with Afghanistan that can be very complicated um, and actually very beneficial for Pakistan in terms of the mining industry. So one more quick look at the population density. You can kind of see up in here, uh, Islamabad and uh, even uh, uh, Lahore. So you see kind of the population actually getting more and more as you head towards India. So really a lot of this uh, is a big question in my mind. Like you can kind of say, well, obviously the fault is kind of more towards India. Um, there's not a whole lot of people down here in Karachi. It's one of the largest cities on earth, but a lot of that population is still heading out towards New Delhi and the Central Valley of India. And that area, I really question as sustainable um, just because it is nice to have the farmland there, but I just wonder, um, you know, in the United States, typically you have a large plot of land and farmed by uh, many people. Um, and it's just different, uh, kind of like the farming might be more micro farming in India. And so there might be lead to a lot of greed of owning farmland versus uh, just trying to live on the ocean front or maybe up in the mountain hills or something like that. This is, some, this is something I should look at really carefully. Um, it is the uh, basically all the manufactured goods of Pakistan. You see cotton and yarn being really good. Uh, cement actually being quite a large uh, section here, uh, even over the years, um, being quite good. Uh, motorcycles also being quite good. Uh, refrigerators uh, being interestingly good. Uh, and then some of the larger companies in Pakistan. So if you do it by the sales, I think I sort of this, you can see primarily oil, interestingly enough. Um, and maybe some of that has to do with that transportation that we saw into Dubai. Um, and you see there's actually uh, they're losing money here. Um, but so out of the oil industry and more into the mining industry may be wise decision for Pakistan. So give you a quick view of what Karachi might look like from the beach. You can see they're definitely building a lot of new buildings here. All four of these buildings are brand new. You can see this guy walking on the beach. Uh, but some interesting view of what, how the economy is kind of changing in Pakistan, maybe even towards uh, telecommunications, internet, and uh, other areas. And this is more of the uh, other thing that you're starting to see. You see a lot of industry actually in this region. I don't know how old this map is, but uh, you know it's kind of, uh, you see cement, uh, ceramics, all these other industries. I don't think this is very helpful. You know, Basically, if you're looking at industry, you primarily want to focus on this uh, economy of Pakistan page, uh, and then also look at a breakdown like this. Um, can be more helpful. There's a page called the List of Companies of Pakistan in the Wikipedia, and it is pretty large here. You can kind of go through here. Um, what I would do is sort it by sector, uh, and then you can see uh, they got aerospace here, airlines, automobiles, banks, clothing, food producers, iron and steel, media, telecommunications, and even water down here in Lahore. So uh, that is a very good list uh, to take a look at for specifics uh, and then you can even take these over to LinkedIn uh, or another source and search for them and kind of find specific people to work with. Here's an interesting picture of Pakistan. You can see up in the hills, a high mountain lake, um, some little city over here with people, uh, some very beautiful mountains. Um, this is one of the reasons why people have moved north. Um, that's just so beautiful up in the mountains. Uh, but it can get very cold in the wintertime. Um, there's also the risk of just being in the rural areas, um, you know, with different uh, refugees coming in through Afghanistan and some other areas. So, but it's still a very interesting part of Pakistan is the north uh, in Islamabad. See another picture here. This is of the Salt Hills. Uh, some pretty modern cars driving through here. You can kind of see uh, what it would look like. Pakistan actually has the largest dam on earth. Um, the Sindhi River apparently, and this is the dam here. Uh, you can kind of see uh, what's going on with that. 
I don't totally agree with damning things, um, to be honest. Uh, I think it's very wise to try to uh, let the flood uh, flood. Um, in the United States, they even have laws against blocking rivers. Um, I don't know if that's true in Pakistan, but they call it riparian water rights. Um, and there's a whole uh, thing and topic on not blocking water. So. Uh, and trying to understand where the water is actually going to. So here you can see the climate map. You can see definitely uh, arid desert down here in the south. So that is one of the biggest questions about why to set up a project in Karachi. Um, you basically have a better land, but the pollution also becomes a factor. So it is a really big trade-off. I think if you get high enough up into the hills, you can be uh, safer from the pollution, uh, maybe even rise above the pollution, but it just is such a problem um, that it's almost impossible to avoid. Um, but you basically see uh, some of that layout here. Kind of a interesting satellite image, pretty high resolution here. Kind of see uh, what it might look like uh, just from the satellite. I usually use zoom.earth, uh, and that can be helpful. Or there is another website, and I'll show you that in a second. The other major site is NASA Worldview, and it can be very helpful. Um, to see now you can start to see where this pollution problem is the case so you can see the clouds kind of back up here um, and this is all believe it or not pollution and you can see especially in China so it really depends on the day um, but it can last for months and months so you can see this is all very very polluted here um, and I'm really sorry to show you these images um, but you can kind of see back in here and even in here you can see that there's a little pocket in the mountains and it this would be an awesome place to live, but man, they got a not a lot of cars, especially in this area. Uh, and some of these areas, and it actually just is very polluted. So this becomes right around here, uh, Lucknow, you can see this is extremely polluted. And this runs out, God, how many miles is that? 200 miles into the ocean. So this is a huge problem. Um, and you can see here in Bangladesh, but maybe 50 to 100 miles out of the ocean. So it's just extremely hard to control this um, and things. So, but this image is one of the worst. Uh, it's not the worst I've ever seen, believe it or not. I've seen some even worse images than this. Uh, but here is maybe a more cleaner day and you see most of that pollution being actually on the India side. Um, so it just kind of, the clouds get stuck here uh, and you can see all this cloud pattern underneath that might even be pollution. So if we clear that up for a day or so, you start to see basically this area. So it's not necessarily Bangladesh's fault, but the pollution all follows the river and essentially dumps out into here. And this lasts for even 500 miles or more, a thousand miles. Um, the, the air quality can be terrible. Um, so, and this is also happening in Bangkok um, and you can see in China, as well so this is not a topic to debate about it's a tough i mean we absolutely have to do something about it um and you know public transportation is one of the biggest things so you know when you look at the areas here transportation two percent man let's let's focus on this you know doing housing developments everything we possibly can to link transportation with housing. So I would say, dang, man, transportation is gonna help you uh, a lot of ways uh, with you know working on some new ways like electric vehicles and other things. So making that even 25% of your 50% of the economy. So why doesn't Pakistan specifically work on their own car, um, you know, and trying to do electric cars or something. So a uh, huge problem uh, to think about. So I wanna go back to this image and zoom out. So you see that the whole world is not like this. So it just happens that that is the way it is there. Um, and you can see some kinds of pollution here uh, heading out uh, <laughs> along the coast of Africa as well. So it is not, um, it is not as serious a problem as in China and you know, basically, you'd have to argue that both uh, this area of China and, you know, basically it's, it's, it's slightly thinner, but it's more consistent in China. So you see that the wind system, uh, it does lock it in. So certain days can be the worst in India, right? Um, and you basically get 
some problems. So you have to look at this over. I've been looking at this problem at least over the last couple of years. So I've been studying NASA worldview. Um, and there is a better page that I can show you that basically shows you the, uh, let me see if I can get that. So they basically, this is the better page supposedly, but um, it's nice to see the satellite image because you can basically just see it. Um, but they have these sensors that basically, that they've installed all over the world, um, sometimes just any place. But you can grab the sensor, um, and I think you can see uh, what it looks like over a month. Um, so down in here, you can see where the sensor's located. Um, this one's in uh, Prussia War, but, uh, and they basically show you uh, the data. Um, I don't know how to grab it over the month right now, and but there was a way to see. They did used to have like a whole big square, and you kind of see what it looks like over the month. But this is kind of one way to look at it. Um, so you can definitely see here where these purple, very unhealthy, you know, very unhealthy is probably even a light word to say it. Um, you know, it's just really bad. So I would say, you know, even making, focusing, because these places have basically become the worst, they need to change radically uh, to being the best, right? So this is extremely important land. It's actually very nice and warm here year round. Why not focus on having that be the central part of the economy? Um, and we can learn a lot from India and China as they start to solve this problem um, at a large scale for the billions of people that live out here. So again, how specifically to do that is to focus more on the transportation sector. You see on the import side, they actually have more imports. So they may want to look carefully with partnering with these import companies in transportation. Um, and uh, you can see uh, basically this. So uh, there is an overtime thing. So you can also see this as a point here, 2012 being where the economy was doing good and right in there. This is even more, I would say this is even more important than the currency. Uh, graph that we were looking at earlier, those time frames being basically see these two hills here at 2018, uh, particularly there being a uh, problem. Um, but I mean, how can you be happy about your work, your life with such a polluted environment? Um, so that's got to change. And I think you'd even save the entire country uh, from political turmoil um, by solving these kind of problems. So I don't know how to end this topic, but we're gonna try to end this right now. It's been a quite a long discussion. I hope uh, you've learned quite a lot from it. If you're really interested in doing some more research, you might go head over to Google Scholar um, and use that. Um, there is a paper, um, I wanna find that really quick. It's uh, by either IMF or World Bank uh, that is very detailed uh, that you should definitely take a look at. Anyway, I can't find that paper, but I think I found it through web search or something, but my data right here might actually be more comprehensive than the paper published by them anyway. So take a look at other people's research on the topic. Uh, you might even just type in transportation, transportation, and uh, this might be one of the most important areas to study. Uh, and also uh, for detailed work, you can go in here and click on the boats and you can even find out who the specific boat is and company. So you can start to partner with some of these companies uh, to work on the transportation problem. There also is research papers here. These are the research papers you can look at. Infrastructure and economic growth. I have not looked at this paper. I will not validate this paper in any way, but um, sometimes you can see the names of the people. You can look them up, uh, contact them, and start to work on either pollution problems, transportation, technology, internet, infrastructure, whatever. Do the search on Google Scholar, um, and you can see some great people. Um, but there are a lot of people um, not necessarily uh, out there that you can find um, to work with. So uh, there's a lot of resources. Um, so I hope this has been very helpful for you. Uh, let me know what ideas you have. I hope this will definitely benefit uh, people there. Thanks.